Hello and welcome to Creating a Human Rights Culture, which aims to promote a lived awareness of the interdependency and indivisibility of human rights principles in our minds, hearts, and bodies, that is, dragged into our everyday lives. What, after all, is freedom of speech to a person who is homeless and lives in a world at war? Therefore, it is dedicated ultimately to the application of the Human Rights Triptych, which in brief consists of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at its center, the Conventions, that is International Treaties on the right, and Implementation Measures on the left. Greetings. My name is Joseph Franca, and welcome to another episode of Creating a Human Rights Culture which calls for a lived awareness of human rights principles in our minds and our hearts and dragged into our everyday lives. Today I am here with Senator Joe Comerford. Hello, Senator Joe Comerford. Hello. I'm so happy that you could spend this time with, with me. Thank you so And much with our viewers. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I, I know you're very busy. Um, it took us two months to get a time that all three of us could agree on. You've been in office for about, well, about two months, seven weeks, and I'm so happy that you could come here. Um, the viewers, you may be interested to know that I met Senator Comerford um, at a recent gathering um, in the uh, Human Rights Week, it's called, at the Jones Library. Amnesty International sponsors every annually a, a human rights um, gathering and assembly and she was our keynote speaker. And I must say I was really uh, rather impressed. All the things that you have done and you spoke about and the things that you want to do um, to give people of this state um, or wherever. Um, basic human rights to adequate shelter, Homelessness is a problem. Uh, food security. Um, I don't know the data exactly in Massachusetts, but Children's Defense Fund had said one out of three children goes to bed hungry at night in the United States or is at risk of being hungry. In the Hampshire you could add to the District, 22,000 people are food insecure. So that means they can't guarantee where their next meal is going to come from. Well, that's terrible. Thanks for telling us that information is power and where is the outrage? I have no idea, okay? Well, maybe we'll get some of our viewers mad and get them um, to do something. Um, uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, so um, I also wanted to say that um, Senator Comerford and I were kind of kindred spirits. I teach, uh, as you know, I professor of social work at Springfield College mm -hmm. and I know you're a social worker you have a master's in social work where did you study Boston Hunter College, oh, Hunter Co Hunter Co Hunter Co City. oh I know Hunter College yeah I'm a Brooklyner originally okay so we're kind of kindred spirits and um, there is an expression um, that I always say in my classes the International Federation of Social Work has said that from its inception social work has been a human rights profession, okay? So what I'd like to do um, today is go through some of the articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is now 70 years young. Mm -hmm. 70 is young, everybody. <laughs> and um, believe me, I know. And um, um, talk about, um, well, anything you want to talk about. Talk about what you've done to provide these rights. Talk about what you're thinking of doing to provide these rights, and also talk about how we could um, how we could help you. Um, I'd like to engage in what the United Nations calls a creative dialogue mm -hmm. with you and our viewers to um, to provide all of these rights that basically speak to a uh, human need. I'm going to go through each of the articles, and you could uh, give me. Um, any uh, feedback? That was a good place to stop, so you can start right where you were. All right. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So um, let me begin to roast you. I'm just joking. <laughs> right. I'm just kidding. Um, it's okay if you want to roast me about human rights. Oh. This is a good topic, Joe. 
Okay, well, uh, let's just talk. And if it gets out to be roasting, I'll, I'll roast you. If not, I'd, I'd like to just engage in some kind of uh, a creative dialogue, how we can promote these rights and how we can um, implement them. Mm -hmm. Now, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights consists of all sorts of stuff. We can't do everything today. It talks about human dignity, mm -hmm. um, it talks about non-discrimination, it talks about freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. Those are very important rights. But let's just for the time being maybe set our priorities on what are referred to as economic and social rights. So rights are interdependent. I mm -hmm. mean, you really can't free have freedom of speech if you're homeless. You know, I mean, it's hard to get the get your voice out, you know, or you're living in a world at war. Um, so rights are interdependent, so it's a complicated issue. Mm -hmm. But let's at least emphasize here the um, um, economic and social rights. They are basically in Articles 23 through Articles 28 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So uh, we can talk. I don't know if you have any questions or comments right now. We'll just go right into the I articles. think we should go right in. I, you know, one thing for clarification for your uh, listeners, for our listeners. Yeah, tell me about yourself. Okay, no, well, sorry, I, I should have asked. I just want to make asked. sure that we're, uh, we're talking about the Hampshire-Franklin-Worcester State Senate District. Okay. Right, so that's 24 cities and towns. Mm -hmm. Amherst is at the base, and it goes up to Connecticut, uh, and it goes right to Royalston and left to Coleraine, so up to Vermont and the New Hampshire border. So it's a very, very large district, uh, 160,000 people in the district that I'll talk about. So when I referenced, for example, earlier the food insecurity number, it's the food insecurity number for our district, you know, where I'm working as your state senator. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Great. Okay, um, yeah, I should have, yeah, by the way, is there anything else you want to tell us before I get in, into this? Uh, you know, only about that it, this is the greatest uh, honor of my life. To be able to serve this district is the greatest honor of my life. And I'm really, really proud to be state senator for this region and I you know I, frankly I've assembled an amazing team so we're working every day for the people of this district okay and how can um, our viewers contact you uh, so I got have an email or what yeah, I mean you I'm can sure reach they're going to help you out yeah we okay. can you can reach me at joe.comerford so just my name joe.comerford j o j o dot. at masenate.gov uh, we I'm on Facebook I'm on Twitter um, okay. We have a Boston office they can find through a mass.gov website, and we're opening an office soon at the University of Massachusetts. So we'll, I'll, be at, I'll be in Amherst on a regular basis. Cool. I'm in the district um, Friday through Monday, okay. and then often in Boston Tuesday through Thursday. Oh, that's great. So that means I could have you on the show once a week for, I'm just joking. I know your time's busy, but it's Well, no, uh, no. It's but great yeah, to, we're trying, you know. I'm trying to really figure out the good prioritization. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thanks. So sure. now you know. So let's get right into uh, some of the articles. These are what are referred to as economic and social rights or mm -hmm. positive rights. They talk about the obligations of government to provide these rights for mm -hmm. other people. Um, it's kind of a complicated issue. Rights have corresponding duties, but I don't want to get into that right now. I think the viewers will get the point. Article 23 says that everyone has the right to a job, mm -hmm. the right to work, the right to choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and to protection against unemployment. People have the right to equal pay for equal work. They have the right to just and favorable remuneration, ensuring for themselves and their family an existence worthy of human dignity. Does that sound familiar, viewers? Are you getting a salary that gives you human dignity? I don't know. And supplemented, if necessary, by other means of social protection. Now, um, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was a sort of chief honcho around the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. She headed the United States delegation and they asked her, well, how do you define, how does the United States define the right to work? And Eleanor Roosevelt said, the right to work means a job that is socially useful, 
contributes to the development of the human personality. See, we are kindred spirits, we're both social work. Okay. And also contributes to a person's purchasing power. Mm -hmm. um, and as many of our viewers know, Trump is bragging about how we have more jobs and everything. But the question is, are these jobs, you know, reasonably paid? Are they contributing to the development of the human personality? Are they socially useful? I'll stop talking. You're the one whose viewpoint we want to get hold of. Um, what are you doing or how, how do you um, envision more jobs in Hampshire County or this area, the area that you represent? And you know what, what could we do? And what are some of your thoughts about how things exist right now? I had three initial thoughts. Okay. Uh, one is that in the last session, the legislature passed, which was a, a very important um, piece of legislation uh, requiring a $15 minimum wage. Sounds uh, good to me. It was very good. Uh, so that is going to be indexed over time. Uh -huh. You know, so brought in, phased in over time. Um, many people, including myself, would have had that a, a bit hastened, right, so that we wouldn't wait. Um, but we will get to $15 an hour. Um, we understand that that's a minimum wage. It's not necessarily a living wage for right. people. So part of the work of the legislature is as we continue to chip away at increasing that base wage to understand that for many places in our district, for example, that still will not provide a kind of living wage that someone right. can count on. Uh, Especially so, if they get ill. I mean, it has to be supplemented with some kind of health insurance. Sure, there's okay. there's the there's the cost of health care. So um, so that there's that right. There's a piece okay. of that. We now have to make yeah. sure that state contracts, uh -huh. where they have workers who need that increased wage, are getting the kind of federal and state um, infusion that they need to be able to pay their workers. Uh -huh. uh, so there's a piece of work to be done in this session. So I think about that. I think about all of the intersecting pieces of this puzzle about good jobs, and that includes yeah. healthcare and making healthcare affordable because, uh, you know, on a very base salary, um, our individuals and families are having a tremendously difficult time affording healthcare as is. You know, we make a lot of, um, we have a lot of celebration in the Commonwealth that we have such a, a high rate of care, uh, and it's true. Uh, and, you know, that is something to be proud of. But what's true about our health care is that it's fragmented and costly, and sometimes it fails us when it, we need it most, yes. right? So in addition to thinking about good wages, we have to think about the intersecting things like health care. We have to think about public transportation. Exactly. Which is Rights really, are interdependent. really yeah. lagging in our district especially, uh, both in terms of rail and in terms of bus service, we have to think about things like education, the right to an education or workforce yeah, development training, yeah. you know, that, um, that actually is intersecting with getting people the kind of job that they need and deserve. Um, there's another piece of this uh, declaration or this, this article that talks about the protections for workers. Yes. And one of those protections that exists currently, but I've filed a piece of legislation around, is the earned income tax credit. Uh -huh. Now that's a very good thing, right? It says to workers, keep working, and we're gonna give you a credit based on your work, essentially. Um, but, but my legislation says, hey, why do we have a cap for elders? Elders are still working, they need to continue to work. Exactly. And there's a gap between when we can currently accept EITC, or the earned income tax credit, or apply for it, and when Medicare kicks in. And so, mine would raise what's called the elder cap on the earned income tax credit. So there is that kind of net uh -huh. underneath a workforce that is getting older. So those are some initial thoughts. Um, initial thoughts sound, sound great to me, thank you. And the uh, last part of that article talks about collective bargaining, mm -hmm. that workers have a right to organize um, it says here, workers have a right to form and join trade unions for mm -hmm. the protection of their interests. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Sure. You know, uh, in the post-Janus world, yes. so that's, the, of course, the Supreme Court decision, uh, you know, that really took uh, the nation by storm. In the post-Janus world, those of us who believe that when unions win, everybody wins, which uh -huh. is, I do, I believe that, uh -huh. um, you know, need to be in solidarity with labor and organizing um, to ensure that labor, which is really under attack after Janus, 
um, Could continues you to feel. Explain to the viewers what Janus is exactly. It's a Supreme Court decision. Which uh, said exactly. Well, it said basically. And when um, did it happen? Um, I don't know. Roughly. Remember the okay. date? Last year. Um, I don't remember the oh, exact date. Oh, it was last date. year. Yep. Okay. All right. um, uh, it said basically uh, dues are not uh, union dues are. Oh yeah, I remember that. Right. Oh, okay. Are. Um, are not mandatory, right? So it's basically an opt-in. Um, and so those of us, and so it really threatens the well-being of unions, right? To be able to continue to grow and be robust and provide services for members, provide that kind of organizing scaffolding that we need them to do to demand things like fair work, um, you know, fair work for a fair pay and the kind of worker safety and environmental safety legislation that they've led other kinds of you know, social good that unions have been at the vanguard around, including health care. Um, so you know, we, need to, we need to be shoulder to shoulder with organized labor and, and protect the right to organize, protect the right to unionize here in the Commonwealth, uh, and you know, continue to say that when unions win, everybody wins. Sounds good to me. Let's, let's move on. OK. The next article, Article 24, and I'm sure our viewers are going to resound with this one. I'm going to, I think of this sort of, I think of my students, my poor students, because they go to class Saturday and Sunday on the weekends, and they're working full time. Yeah. They're supporting families, and they're also dedicated. Um, Article 24, everyone has the right to rest and leisure, including reasonable limitations of working hours and periodic holidays with pay. The statistic that I know is that it takes roughly three incomes to support a family. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for parents to spend time with their kids. They come home and they're just t very tired and they love to read a um, story to their children. Believe me, I know this one. But you know, you just get very tired. And um, um, so the right to rest and leisure has been seriously abrogated, I feel in this culture. And uh, we live in Western Mass, which has all this nature and you know kayaking and canoeing and all this stuff. And um, maybe it is that you know some parents and some people don't really have time to be doing this. So I'm wondering what you thought about the right to rest and leisure. I just have to add that in Europe, um, and Europe's got its problems, believe me. Um, France and Germany, for well, I think France has government mandated five weeks vacation time, and Germany it's uh, six weeks mandated. And I also tell my students um, if they have a master's in social work, every four years they get a, like a three or four month sabbatical. I think it's every four years. So there's more of an attunement to um, rest and leisure in Europe, but it still has its problems. So I just wondered about some of your thoughts on sure, rest I mean, and leisure. I mean, it's related to the question before, yeah. uh, but whatever. OK. Uh, you know, we know. Um, I didn't know the statistic you just shared about taking three salaries. I have um, seen this on numerous yeah. occasions. So we do know that the amount of disposable income, income for families is shrinking. Um, we know folks are having to work longer hours um, for plateaued wages. Um, and then this has led to a real erosion on disposable time or free time. Um, that threatens family well-being, it threatens civic well-being, you know, because if folks are trying to put two or three jobs together to feed their families and take care of their, you know, their responsibilities there, they have less time, not only at home, but also to engage civically in organizing or in any kind of fabric, you know, the fabric of a civic life. So that threatens democracy as well as our family structure. Um, you know, so uh, it's, it's one of the issues with wages not actually climbing with what it costs to live. Yeah, you're right. I think we all agree, and I think that's, that's got to stop, you know? Yeah, I, you know, it, that's all part and parcel with actually having a federal and a state government that invests in the programs that are going to raise all boats, right? We've invested in tax policy and other kind of spending policy that actually benefits or disproportionately benefits the wealthiest among us. And all boats haven't been lifted, but we have to lift all boats. And that's 
partly we have to increase the wages of earners. Yes, right. So they don't have to have three mm -hmm. jobs to support a family. Um, it's, um, it is pretty terrible. I'm going to move right on. Okay. Now, Article 25 is actually um, a long one. And maybe we could stop and talk about each of these. Um, I'll pause maybe and just talk about um, your thoughts. Um, Article 25, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family. Uh, by the way, Eleanor Roosevelt wanted non-sexist language, and they're talking of revamping this. And uh, I mean, it is 70 years old, mm -hmm. um, and people are talking about revamping, which is fine with me. Um, yeah. Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, for example, which is a great group. Mm -hmm. Speaking of good girls gone bad, making a joke. Oh well, it's a great group. They wanted to add a, a right to uh, potable water, mm -hmm. you know, okay. on the Declaration, but. This is all we have, and I think it's great. Um, so, uh, blah, blah, where was I? Everyone has a right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family or herself, including. So I'll just read this, and we'll go through each one of these. All right, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, mm -hmm. and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age or other lack of livelihood and circumstances beyond his control. Motherhood and childhood are entitled to special care and assistance. All children, whether born in or out of wedlock, shall enjoy the same protection. Um, you could respond in toto, as they say, or why don't we go each one, over each one of these? Um, people have a right to food. Sure. And let's let's well, think what do about you this want in to the do? big picture, okay, right? Sure. Because what what you're talking about there, those rights, those guarantees, are really bedrock to policy, to social policy. Exactly. Right. And they're also bedrock concerns to budget priorities, both right. in terms of tax priorities, how we're going to make the money, and then spending priorities, how we're going to spend it. What are we going to spend it all on? Um, and you know, so those kinds of assurances are really the work of government. You better believe it. So. Uh, and but that, government needs to be pushed. They tend to be so reluctant. Right. Well, so we and I would push say them. that you know many of my colleagues in the state legislature are, you know, some of the better minds with whom I've ever worked. Um, so they're you know they're good folks. But what you're getting at, which I believe in, is that nothing happens. Nothing happens in government without a broad people's movement pushing exactly. in. Exactly. And that I think lawmakers that are the most powerful and get the most done for their people, and I hope to be this kind of person. Are you know know that they have to reach across and actually pull people in and work in partnership on issues like education, healthcare, the environment, revenue, you know issues that are really going to be life and death issues for people. Um, it's it's going to take that kind of mass outpouring of energy uh, and demand for government to work in everyone's best interest, not just a wealthy few. That's the kind of demand that's at the heart of things like. Elder financial security, so elders are mentioned. Yes. You know, so right now, Massachusetts has a very poor rating. We are second from the bottom, second only to Mississippi in an elder economic security index. Is that so? I didn't know that. Yeah, it's tragic. <coughs> Excuse me. That means... That's okay. Very tragic. I didn't our, know that. Yeah, well. That our elders cannot be guaranteed to live independently. <coughs> yeah, take it easy. Without great okay. concern. And that's the result of policy, right? That's the result of policy choices. Uh, so some of the legislation I've filed goes right at that. <coughs> Excuse me. Take it easy. Okay, so um, so that is um, uh, responding um, to all of them. Um, maybe we can sort of uh, piecemeal it down a little, even though we understand. Um, it's all budgetary, progressive taxation, sure. things like that. Um, but I don't know. Well, let's let's just see. Let's take food for example. You mentioned it before. Um, <clears throat> again, um, the United Nations um, has said that uh, the right to food means food that is nutritious, easily accessible, culturally appropriate, and reasonably priced. Do you think we have food like that? I mean, you go to the 
uh, supermarket and I don't know where people are getting into the habit of eating junk food and um, um, what could we do to make food more nutritious um, um, what well, else did I, I say? Think so the right, our and food also system many, here in Massachusetts yes. is actually one of the more sophisticated in the nation. Um, okay. So what you're talking about here is enough, enough food, right? In part, enough food. Yes. So in Massachusetts, we have something called the Massachusetts Emergency Food Assistance Program, or MEFA. Okay. Which joins with USDA food in becoming some of the main staples in food banks. Okay. Then there's food policy really looking at the way in which we, for example, support our farmers to grow more organic food or more kinds of food that are needed by mm -hmm. both food banks and also consumers. Mm -hmm. And then we have the budgetary piece of this, where we look at the ways in which, through the Department of Agriculture or other intersecting departments, we're actually incentivizing uh, local agriculture, um, dairy and, you know, and, and produce, to be as robust as it possibly can to both, you know, support food banks, to support um, local businesses, uh, and then ultimately to make its way, or and schools, which is where a lot of our local produce and um, dairy goes, uh, and then ultimately to make its way to a family's dinner table. So it's both about the quantity and creating a food system that helps those um, most affected by hunger and food, food insecurity, uh -huh. and then it's about supporting farmers. Um, so we have a number of programs in addition to MEFAP and other budgetary uh, allocations, including the Healthy Incentives Program, which mm -hmm. says to folks who are receiving the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or food stamps, uh -huh. hey, if you go and you have food stamp money, we can, we can give you extra money if you're, say, for example, at a winter farmer's market, right? You can get more fresh stuff if you come to this market and use your food stamps. Mm -hmm. um, so there are all these initiatives at play all the time, except it's not enough, uh, you know, because people are still food insecure. People still face hunger, even in a commonwealth like Massachusetts. Hopefully we can continue this discussion. Um, okay, great what to have pleasure. you. A pleasure. Okay.